Well, thanks. Wait to see my video I'm going to do on the way home. Sorry, Susan. Uh, or I'm sorry, Kent. Uh, Senator Kent. <laughs> What's your name again? <laughs> Hello and welcome to Call the Senate, a podcast presented by the Minnesota Senate DFL Caucus. I'm Luke Bishop. On today's episode, we'll discuss the end of the first special legislative session at the Minnesota Legislature and the tumultuous uh, conclusion to a contentious legislative year. Uh, after negotiations wrapped up and the governor signed the budget last week, the House, Re the House of Representatives adjourned sine die, meaning that session is over until next year. Senate Republicans, on the other hand, chose not to adjourn sine die, claiming that they wanted to wait to adjourn until Governor Walls had signed the budget. We've recently learned that this was not the true reason why Senator Gazelka chose to continue the special session, and instead the Senate returned to session to take up the confirmation of Governor Wall's commissioners. Yesterday, after mounting pressure from Senate Republicans, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Commissioner Laura Bishop resigned from her post ahead of a scheduled Senate consideration of her appointment. Republicans were expected to remove her from office in retaliation for her implementation of Minnesota's clean cars rulemaking. Here on the show to talk about it, our Senate Minority Leader, Susan Kent. Welcome, Senator Kent. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Luke. Good to see you. Likewise. Thank you. And Senator Ann Johnson-Stewart, a freshman senator representing District 44. How are you doing today, Senator Johnson-Stewart? I'm also good. Thank you, Luke. Good. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to ask the first question of Senator Kent. Senator Kent, can you just tell us about the work of Laura Bishop and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, as well as your thoughts on Commissioner Bishop's uh, departure and the Republican pressure that, that led to it? Well, um, thanks, Luke. You know, let's remember that um, Governor Walls recruited Laura Bishop, who had done amazing environmental and sustainability work in the private sector with major corporations in, in Minnesota. And so she really brought that perspective. And it's a big deal. Um, and I, it's, you know, uh, Senator Johnson Stewart and I both come from the private sector ourselves. And, uh, you know, to have those voices at the table uh, in a, in a, in a cabinet is a big is is important. Um, she has done incredible work uh, for the environment, dealing with climate change, whether it is, you know, fighting for uh, the clean cars standards and um, electrification of our system for electric vehicles. Um, I'm in the East Metro where PFAS have been a huge issue, and she has really helped lead the mitigation with the 3M settlement in a very strong way, as well as on a statewide basis, um, putting in place processes to monitor and and mitigate and, and keep Minnesotans safe and make sure we have clean and healthy water. There are so many things that she has led for our clean and healthy futures. And so it's really frustrating um, that uh, she basically was, was not given the opportunity to continue doing that very important good work. So you, you mentioned a little bit about Commissioner Bishop's track record and how she was, you know, well, more than well qualified for this position. So I just wanted to follow ask, up and ask, you know, as the Republicans put pressure um, on her, why, why Laura Bishop? Why her? What was the motive behind all of this? Was it really, um, were, was the intent of the Senate Republicans really just to review her and her job performance, or was it retribution for, for policy disagreements and policy matters? Well, I think the answer to that is both, right? I mean, that um, first of all, and and I think what's been good about this process and this extension of the special session, if you will, is we've been able to really force this conversation. Last summer, um, they um, did not confirm, which means they removed Commissioner Nancy Lepic in the Department of Labor and Industry and Commissioner Steve Kelly from the Department of Commerce. Um, similar, uh, they didn't agree with the way they were doing their jobs. And let's be clear, these are appointments by the governor to advance his agenda. And we have a divided legislature in the state and we have a DFL governor elected by Minnesotans and we have a very narrow Republican majority in the Senate. And they are using this to penalize um, uh, uh, these agency heads for advancing the governor's agenda for which he was elected, right? And then, um, and then you think about the way that they're doing it and that's where it's problematic. We as a Senate are there for advice and consent. And if you think about the US Senate, think about the different confirmations they do for secretaries of the different agencies in Washington or for Supreme Court justices as was brought up on the, on the Senate floor earlier today. Um, 
That process happens before they start their jobs, right? The way the Senate Republicans are doing it is, oh, you've been in this job and you've done something that we disagree with, therefore we're gonna take you out. And they've, they've got, I think 19 commissioners still unconfirmed. They call it a job review process. That's not what advice and consent is. That is a veiled and not so veiled threat that if you do something that we don't agree with, we will remove you from your job. That's bad in its own right, but it also sets a terrible precedent and it makes it really hard for us to recruit really qualified people like Laura Bishop to come and do this important work for our state. Absolutely right, yes. Uh, and Senator Johnson Stewart, so some people have called this um, an abuse of power. Others have pointed to the fact that every day of the special session is wasting taxpayer money. Thousands of dollars were wasted. I'm just wondering, as a new law, as a new lawmaker in your first term at the Minnesota Senate, what is your perspective on this? The the games, the uh, the the overall outcome of the special session, and how it's gone uh, in the last week or so. Well, how it's gone in the last week has been different than how it went for the first ten days. So the last week has been very disappointing, frankly. You know, even last week in the final, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we did a lot of waiting and 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 not doing very much of anything. Now, I understand that there's a process and that it's typical to have to wait for some bills to come from the House. So I'm not saying that that's never okay, because, you know, as a newbie, I don't really get what is okay and what's not. But my understanding is we had a lot of extra waiting. And then um, what was happening in the House with the Republicans wanting to filibuster, that was frustrating because even, you know, I sit next to Ann Rust and Senator Rust was telling me we could be doing this, we could be doing this. Um, and so from a reliable source, I think we could have been doing much more with our time. Um, especially this week was just crazy to come down and spend two extra days. Now I wasn't here yesterday because my family's on vacation, but um, for them to, you know, require overtime costs for time that is unnecessary. As a boss, if my staff does that, I have stern words with them. So for example, if we have a rain day on construction, that's a great, great day to catch up. If my employees dare charge overtime on a rain day, they will hear from me because it's inappropriate, right? So I feel like today is like a rain day during construction. We should have done our work last week. There's no reason for us to be here. Um, but as a newbie, you know, I'm watching and learning and a little frustrated, but also find the whole posturing pretty interesting. Absolutely. I think, and your experience, you know, in the private sector and construction goes, uh, you know, right along with what you and uh, Senator Kent were talking about earlier with uh, that experience is really important in the Senate and gives you an, uh, an important perspective um, on uh, the need for efficiency in, in, in this body. So Senator Kent, uh, I have another question for you. I think, you know, the Republicans have made it clear that they have their sights set on a number of commissioners beyond just Laura Bishop. And uh, can you just tell the listeners sort of what's happened so far in their approach in terms of uh, using the authority of the Senate uh, to advise and consent on the governor's appointments? Well, this is this one has been particularly interesting. I mean, last time around, you know, they very just specifically at the last minute brought the um, appointment of uh, Nancy Lepping from Department of Labor and Industry to the floor with no notice. I mean, literally across the aisle, Senator Gazelta texted me that that was about to happen in a matter of seconds. Um, that didn't go well for them. So they did give us a little more notice the next time with Steve Kelly. This time, because, you know, there have it, it, you know, a lot of the names that have been out there have been women. Um, it, it, there are those who have speculated that uh, they have a, a hard time with smart, strong, talented women. Um, and so this time they put up three male appointees that were non-controversial, and then they had three women uh, who were more controversial, more and less, because I, I think they were trying to make this seem like, oh yeah, we're taking up a bunch of commissioners. This isn't targeting anyone. Um, but once uh, Commissioner Bishop resigned, then uh, uh, without getting into the minutia and the weeds of, of today's floor session, uh, they were perfectly happy to wrap it up without finishing the confirmations that they had planned to. Now, speaking of the Senate Republicans having a bit of a hard time with 
um, strong, smart women. Uh, Senator Johnson Stewart, I wanted to get your take on the way that the Republicans have sort of conducted them, themselves on the floor recently. I weighed whether or not to ask this question. It's somewhat of a nitty gritty process detail, but the Republicans have gone so far with their interruptions to the point where it has negatively impacted the policy making process on the floor of the Senate. So Senator, can you just speak to how these interruptions and these points of order have been a detrimental impact, have had a de detrimental impact and on, on what should be a deliberative approach to the, to the work of the Senate? Well, I think they know exactly what they're doing. Um, I'm a very confident person, but I'm new here. So nearly every time I speak, I get in, not nearly every time, but several times when I speak, I get interrupted. It really throws you off because, you know, and I see this happen to even more uh, competent and qualified people. Um, it's just an interruption and it, it disrupts your, your whole, you know, train of thought. You can't read when you're up there. So, you know, that to, to have somebody jar you like that is disconcerting. I thought Melissa Franzen did a great job yesterday in really standing up for herself and in asserting her right to go on un uninterrupted. Um, I have seen the Republicans do that to the young women. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't say young, but to the new, the younger serving senators, they never do it to Senator Rust. And so I encouraged her to do some um, speaking today. They never do it to uh, Senator Pappas. And so um, I've seen them do it to the younger or the less experienced women. I've seen them do it to the men of color. So uh, Senator Fate gets interrupted quite a bit as does Senator Champion. And I've seen them do it with Senator Fung or Senator Her as well. So it's pretty frustrating. Um, it's a tactic that I think now that we know they do it, you know, Senator Franzen was pretty well prepared yesterday, but I think they're bullish. It's disappointing to me that other women in the Senate do it. Um, I guess, you know, I, I feel like in the interest of equity and fairness, if you can't stand up for people who are like you, then come on, you know, we're all in this together. So that's been pretty frustrating. I did want to make one mention when they were talking about um, the Senator or the commissioner to confirm today, Senator, I was writing down all the words that Senator Newman said, he found her to be so unreasonable, non, you know, she wouldn't compromise. She was a hard negotiator. And it's just, it doesn't even need to be said, but I'm going to say it. These are traits that are extremely admired in men. And the fact that she wouldn't compromise, that is such a, a false argument. I mean, you know, it's like a little kid saying, my mom won't compromise. She makes me eat every day. You know, there's just some things that are non-compromisable on. And so for him to say that, I thought was really indicative of how he feels about working with uh, at least that woman. Well, and I'll just jump in real quick and say, you know, any of us who've been in the workplace for any amount of time as women, we know that to be aggressive and assertive as a, as a man is seen as a desirable trait in the workplace. And when it's women, they usually come up with a different word for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well said, Senator Ken. Um, so shifting gears here just a little bit to today's floor session, Senator Kent, you made the motion to adjourn sine die. And after a long debate and a lot of pushback from the other side of the aisle, the Senate eventually voted 46 to 18 to adjourn session sine die. What did it take to achieve that victory? And what are your thoughts on how the DFL caucus was uh, standing together and lockstep on this issue and, and uh, standing in the way of, you know, uh, really pushing to stop wasting taxpayer money um, on these uh, extra days of special session. One of the things that frustrates me in the Senate, and I, I address this a little bit on the floor today, is stuff is sort of preordained. Um, the majority has a plan. They have, you know, and because we have rules and motions that we have to follow, um, it limits our ability to effectively debate some things. And so when we went on the floor today. Um, I made the motion to adjourn sine die as I have the two previous session days of this extra overtime session um, since the House adjourned sine die. And it was basically to say, we should not be doing this. This is not an appropriate process. This is an abuse, you know. And so today um, I made that motion and it is, it is a high motion procedurally. And so um, 
it's harder to derail, right? And so it gave us the opportunity to use our voices, which is really all we've got when you're in the minority is to, is to offer, offer motions, offer bills, offer things and be able to debate them and discuss them on the floor. And this was really our only opportunity on the floor to go into any depth and detail about why we think this is such a, a flawed, abusive process for the people of Minnesota. And um, so uh, I, I will express my appreciation to the Republican majority for hearing that point finally. And they didn't shut us down like we think they normally would. They, you know, th th it was a moment of comity, as we say in the legislature, <laughs> which means we're getting along. <laughs> and um, we, we were able to have that discussion. It was not preordained. You know, I really wanted us to have this debate. And after listening to their arguments and listening to our members' arguments, um, we could have withdrawn that motion, um, but we really felt like uh, the, the, the Senate majority had put us on this path. This was absolutely the wrong thing to do to use this way um, to, to confirm commissioners and that it needed to, it needed to stop. And so uh, I, I, I was interested that some people who voted, the Republicans who voted um, against the same motion the two previous days voted with us this time. And so we, we ended this session and we will, Commissioners, these appointments should be taken up. There is a process for it. It involves real committee hearings and recommendations from those committees because they're the subject matter experts. You want the Environment Committee talking about how, what the, you know, the qualifications of the Environment Commissioner. Um, and so that exists. And then it comes to the floor for a proper debate and vote. But that happens during regular session. That doesn't happen on a session all of its own making because as uh, Senator Johnson Stewart said, you know, if you're if you're spending your work day talking to your friends, shopping online, you shouldn't then get to choose, you know, charge overtime when you come back and do the other work that you didn't get done during the work hours. So yeah, and Senator Kent had a good point. Um, the other thing that I wanted to affirm was immediately they did try to set, shut down Senator Murphy, if you remember. And the thing I have seen are more um, uh, experienced senators do is they jumped up. So I, I, or Senator Isaacson jumped up, Senator Dibbles jumped up, and Senator Murray jumped up immediately to uh, stand to her defense. And I thought that was great. So it took us a while, but we finally got our kind of our act together on that. Well, they started hearing us. I <laughs> so shifting gears here just a little bit, we've ended the first special session here at the Senate, and we'll be moving into uh, the summer. And I'm just curious, uh, starting with you, Senator Kent, what you see as the next steps, uh, where you see the caucus moving forward over the summer, and uh, just uh, where the legislature will be moving over the over the next uh, year or so? Well, in the immediate, you know, we will be back in our communities, we will be talking to our constituents, and we will be listening to them and discussing what went on during session and having that feedback. The other, there are some things that got put into place through our budget. And one of them is $250 million of the federal funds will be directed to essential workers. Those folks who did all that amazing work over the past 16 months, um, put themselves in harm's way. And there is a working group that will come together to figure out how that gets allocated and distributed. So that's a process that's gonna happen and we will stay in touch about that. There may be a special session in September to address that. Um, and then, uh, you know, we are going to be looking ahead to redistricting. So there will be a lot to pay attention to there. Um, and then uh, session is scheduled to start again January 31st. And we will be drafting bills and engaging with our communities to be ready for that session. So those are that. And that's why we have a part time legislature. That's why, you know, COVID required us to be with the emergency um, powers of the governor required us to come back every 30 days since COVID started. Um, and so we have been in session now off and on for 18 months. And that is not how the Minnesota legislature is intended to work. So it will allow people to go back to their day jobs, um, to their family obligations uh, and to our communities and, and our constituents. And then we can come back and, and act like we're legislators again in, in next, next winter and spring. Senator Johnson Stewart, same question to you. I'm wondering if you have any plans for your for the uh, 
recess that's coming up here. Uh, I know you've done a lot of, uh, you've had a strong focus on infrastructure. I'm just curious as to your plans to interact with your community, the people of your district, your constituents, uh, now that we've uh, adjourned to the special session. Yeah, so Luke, I am, I do have plans. So starting tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I'm gonna host a tour of the Duluth Water Treatment Plant. Uh, we hope to have about 40 people up there. It seems like a really popular thing. Uh, and then as often as I'm able, I'm gonna be hosting infrastructure tours uh, around the state really. And the purpose is not just for the fun backside, you know, inside look at a sewage treatment plant. It's to do a couple things. It's to draw attention to what we need to do to be investing in infrastructure. I was just on the phone with the manager of the plant. That plant in Duluth is over hundred years old over a hundred years old. And so for people to really see what a corroded pipe looks like and to understand that drinking water flows through it, that's a great visual. And we've had press on some of those tours and I hope to just keep you know, raising that megaphone on that issue. The other thing it does is it helps me to you know, partner with my local legislators. So Senator McEwen is gonna be helping me on that tour. Um, I hope to be getting around the whole state and visiting places where we have both Democratic and Republican senators, because if the Republicans don't wanna join me on the tour, I'll be happy to find a candidate who does. And then the other thing I just, um, got thinking about this this morning when Governor Walls was with us, I really want to start raising the issue of jobs and how each one of these projects that I visit, if we were to invest some money in the Duluth uh, water treatment plant, that would bring jobs to pipe fitters and laborers. And, and, you know, as I said this morning, all those guys usually travel, they stay in hotels, they go out to dinner. It's really a way to bring local money. And um, I think we've lost a little bit of touch with labor, not, I mean, I just think we need to reignite labor and I'm happy to do that with my background in construction. Um, I also will be working construction, that's my job. And so I have some projects this summer and then in the fall I'll be, um, we're just gonna keep going. So as much as, as people are willing to have me in their district, I'll be bringing groups around. <clears throat> Absolutely. The the work as a senator might be uh, on pause now, but it sounds like you'll continue to work in your community uh, during this recess. And I, I have to add, I, for one, have learned so much from your uh, infrastructure series. I feel like uh, it's just been a tremendous learning experience for me. I've learned about how uh, the cost of not doing uh, infrastructure can ultimately add up to cost a lot more than just, uh, you know, paving over a road, replacing it costs a lot more. Uh, all these sorts of interesting things, how highways are built. So uh, I've learned a ton. I'm sure that many others have as well. Can well, I say, wait to see my video I'm going to do on the way home. Sorry, Susan. Uh, or I'm sorry, Kent. This is, uh, Senator Kent. <laughs> What's your name again? <laughs> on the way here, I, I was driving on a county road in Wisconsin because I came from my cottage. And there is a perfect, it's called a Moore Circle where we have a slope failure. I cannot wait to go back and do that video today. So watch for that one. So sorry, Susan. Uh, no, Senator what Kent. I was going to say was this. I mean, I love listening to Ann Johnson Stewart. And it's such a great example of the brilliance of the legislative system and process. We all come from very different communities, very different backgrounds, different experiences. And we bring those perspectives into these conversations. And, um, and, and Senator Johnson Stewart is right. I mean, she has done such a great job of connecting the, I mean, I've been on, I've been on the transportation committee for eight years until this year, and I miss it. And, um, but, you know, to be able to have somebody talk about it from a very hands-on way to illustrate what are more sort of theoretical concepts to those of us who are sitting around a hearing room and looking at presentation materials. It's so helpful to have that voice. And so it's, I, that is why this is, I'm, you know, yay, this is a good, such a great example of how the legislature is um, doing things well. Oh, well, thank you. And I've enjoyed this very much. Senator Kent is an awesome leader. She's extremely inclusive, affirming, strong, assertive, and that's just what we need. I really appreciated this session. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a lovely place to uh, leave our episode today. So I just wanna say, you know, Senate Minority Leader Susan Kent, Senator Ann Johnson Stewart, thank you so much uh, for joining the show today. I really appreciated uh, uh, you coming to join us and I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, Luke. My pleasure. Watch for the more circle video, slope failure. Okay. <laughs> Following Johnson Stewart on Twitter. <laughs>
<laughs> Alice is in Kent on Twitter. <laughs> Great. Well, that's it for today's episode of Call of the Senate. You can find us online at senatedfl.mn or on social media under the username SenateDFL. See you again next week. <laughs>